So welcome everyone to the date of the workshop. So today Fabian Asler will be giving first of his three pedagogical lectures on introduction to quantum ventures and integrable models. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I guess uh, as everybody has realized, uh, the organizers of this uh, school and uh, workshop come in two categories, real and imaginary ones. And I'm solidly in the second category, so I'd like to thank uh, the members of the first category to invite me here, for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so I was asked to give some pedagogical lectures on quantum quenches. Pedagogi pedagogical lectures is a bit of a tautology, so I took it to mean introductory lectures. So I will certainly in the first lecture, um, just give an overview of the phenomen phenomenology of quantum quenches. It will be, I hope, very introductory and uh, understandable. If I bore you by it, because you're all too sophisticated, just let me know. Uh, so I have lots of other material I could go through instead. Okay, so let's see how it goes. So in the first part, I will just give you an overview of the phenomenology of quantum quenches, as I just said. So what is a quantum quench? So let's start with a definition. It's the simplest protocol for non-equilibrium dynamics. And when I talk about all I will talk about here, um, I should uh, stress from the onset, is the non-equilibrium dynamics of many particle systems or field theories. So I'm not interested in three or five particles. Yeah? So I'm really interested in macroscopically many or at least uh, a few thousand or a million. Okay, so what is this uh, quench protocol? So uh, we are given a number of things to work with. Uh, so the fundamental thing we are given uh, to work with is a many particle system um, with some Hamiltonian H. This could be a spin chain, and I may, mainly will be talking about spin chain, about lattice models, but it could be a field theory as well. Now the idea is we prepare the system in some initial state. And typically, this initial state will not just be arbitrary, it will be lowly entangled. Yeah? So that means it could be the ground state of some local Hamiltonian, which are lowly entangled. And importantly, uh, that initial state is supposed to have a non-zero overlap with exponentially many eigenstates of my Hamiltonian, but is supposed not to be an eigenstate of my Hamiltonian. Because if it were, it, it would be a stationary state and nothing interesting would happen. Yeah? So, this is, um, so, so this requirement of having non-zero overlap with an exponential number of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian is not very restrictive. I mean, so most of the states you come up with will actually full, automatically fulfill this requirement. But it's important. Yes, I mean, I consider typically a large finite system, yeah, and uh, so the initial state basically should have overlap with almost all the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which is typically the case. It's just, I want to rule out that you come back after this lecture and tell me, oh, look, but I have this, eigen I ha I have this initial state here, and uh, the... Uh, physical behavior of the system after uh, initializing in the state is completely different. And then I would tell you, well, the state you picked is actually a linear superposition of three eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Yeah? And there, uh, uh, the, the, the whole time evolution is elementary. You can treat it by the same methods you treat a single particle in your, in your first quantum mechanics course. I want to rule that out. That's not interesting. That's where this requirement comes from. So now, uh, in a quantum quench, one typically considers isolated systems. Yeah? So there's no environment, there's no dissipation from the system you're interested in to the outside world, which means the time evolution, by definition, is given simply by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So that means, given the Hamiltonian and given the initial state, the state of the system at all subsequent times is fixed. Yeah? It's simply given by the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, so by this formula here. Okay. Um, 
And the goal, what we want to do is we, we are not interested really in this, in this state. There's way too much information in that state. So what we want to do is uh, to study the time evolution of expectation values of local operators. Yeah? So quantities like this in the thermodynamic limit. Yeah? Thermodynamic limit I'm interested in because as usual, if you take the thermodynamic limit, uh, things simplify. So you get some beautiful formulas, whereas you work in a large finite volume, uh, there will be finite size corrections which are complicated. I'm not interested in that in the first instance because they're small. On the? Absolutely none at all. No. Now, what's a local operator? Uh, a local operator I define to act as the identity outside a finite spatial region in the infinite volume limit. So let's think about some quantum spin system in D dimensions, if you wish. So then a local operator would be a string of spin operators on sites of my quantum spin system, but all the sites would be in some finite spatial region yeah, in the thermodynamic limit. So such operators are local. And locality is a key concept in everything that follows. Yeah. No, I mean, in the quantum quench protocol, uh, the Hamiltonian is time independent. And the dynamics is entirely induced by the choice of initial state. Yeah. So you can think about this. Uh, a variant of this protocol is you prepare... The, the system in the ground state of some Hamiltonian, and that Hamiltonian has, is, has a parameter, some interaction strength, uh, like in the Hubbard model, the Hubbard interaction. Yeah? And then at time t equal to zero, you suddenly quench the interaction from some value u naught yeah, to some other value u1, and then you look at the subsequent time evolution. Yeah? So that's the kind of protocol we consider. But Hamiltonian is not time dependent, it's time independent. After the initial shake, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's the quantum quench protocol. And now, why do we want to study this? Yeah? So, we want to study it because this is a rather good approximation or idealization of what is done in a number of cold atom experiments. So, so the standard way of probing the physics and the phenomena I will talk about is by doing experiments on systems of cold atoms which are trapped in, in some electromagnetic traps. So here I just give you uh, a few cartoons of experiments uh, which are done in York Schmidtmeyer's group um, in Vienna. And that will explain what, what quantum quench has to do with experiments and why want, we want to study it. So what they do is they consider rubidium atoms on what's called an atom chip. And uh, so the cartoon is you have a confining potential, which is cigar shaped, which is this blue thing here. And inside this tube, this cigar, let's say you have a few thousand or a few million rubidium atoms. And all of these rubidium atoms are basically in their ground states. So the only degrees of freedom which are important are the motional degrees of freedom. So these rubidium atoms are like quantum mechanical particles with no internal degrees of freedom and they move around. And they can move around uh, in these particular experiments in along one dimension, yeah? and in all other dimensions they are tightly confined. So that basically means you have a harmonic oscillator in the transverse directions, a harmonic oscillator potential, and the first excited state of that harmonic oscillator potential is a very high energy scale. Yeah, so you cannot and you do not basically excite uh, transverse degrees of freedom. So basically these rubidium atoms just sloshing around in your tube, tunneling around in the tube. And the, ham uh, uh, the Hamiltonian uh, for, that describes the dynamics in these experiments is the Hamiltonian given here. So there are n bosonic particles, which are these rubidium atoms, and they have a kinetic energy. Mm. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, this will happen quite a few times because the controls are very close to, to, to one another. Um, yeah, so they have kinetic energy, so xj would be the position of the jth rubidium atom, 
just kinetic energy, they move around, it's quadratic. And then uh, there's an interaction energy. So if two rubidium atoms basically uh, sit on top of each other, they repel or attract depending on what uh, the sign and magnitude of this parameter C is. So typically they repel. Okay, and now what is done in the experiment is, so they start out uh, with a uh, configuration like this, where you have the atoms uh, in your one-dimensional trap. Then what they do is they manipulate the confining potential. So what they say is they split the, the condensate. Okay, so they basically put a barrier here in the middle uh, of this tube and split it into two. So we end up with two tubes yeah, in which you have rubidium atoms. And the splitting is done very, very quickly, if you wish. So that's like a quantum quench. The Hamiltonian this, that describes the time evolution now in the split, for the gases, is just the sum of two Lieb-Leaning Hamiltonians. LL, I should have said, means Lieb-Leaninger. So this is a very famous model of many particle physics. It's... Uh, also known as the uh, delta function Bose gas or the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It's an exactly solvable model, and it was solved by Lieb and Leninger in the 1960s. Okay, uh, so after splitting, now the dynamics is given by a Hamiltonian, which is just uh, the direct sum of uh, two Lieb Leninger Hamiltonians. And uh, through the splitting procedure, you initialize the system in some initial state. And let me not try to discuss what that initial state is. That's a difficult question. So they, you have to basically determine what this state is through measurements. Okay. No. In this particular experiment, no. There's a variant of this experiment where there is a coupling between the two, where atoms can tunnel between the two tubes, and uh, you can analyze that as well. It's more complicated. Um, if you don't have coupling, uh, it turns out at low energies, you can describe this by a field theory which is free, which we like because we can calculate things uh, relatively easily, although it's not that easy, whereas if you keep the coupling on, so this is one of the best realizations we know for a quantum sine gordon model. And you, you would be able to look at the non-equilibrium dynamics of a, you are able to look at the non-equilibrium dynamics of a quantum sine gordon model in this case, but it's much more difficult to do a theory, which is why I stick the, to the first set of experiments um, for now. Okay, but what do they measure? So, first of all, now they let the system time evolve, just as I had said before uh, in this quantum quench protocol. So, you prepare it in some initial state, then you let it evolve in time. Okay? So, you get some time evolved state of the system in the split Bose condensate. Then, what they do at some time t naught, so that they let it evolve for some time, then eventually they switch off the confining potential. They switch off, switch off the potential that forces the rubidium atoms to move in this one dimensional trap. So, then what, what starts happening, these rubidium atoms just start expanding in three dimensional space. Okay? And uh, so, so the, the, the two clouds here, they expand in three dimensions, and eventually they start overlapping. Okay? And then, at some time after your condensates started to overlap, they measure the density of atoms as a function of position. Okay? So now, what are the questions then you, that, that you then want to ask, I mean, in order to explain these measurements. Now, this three-dimensional expansion, one can argue or show, is to a very good approximation free. So that basically means, after I switch off the trap, the evolution of the state of the system is very simple, because it evolves with a free Hamiltonian. Sorry? Okay, so there is gravity, but uh, gravity is negligible uh, for the purpose of uh, these experiments. They, they expand under gravity, yes. But we are not interested in the effects of gravity. 
So, so, so in a sense, uh, what happens is you, you have these atoms in the trap, you switch off the trap, and then because they have momenta, they start basically moving in, in all directions. Okay? And there is gravity, but we are, we are neglecting the effects of gravity. Um, okay, so the expansion is free, which means uh, this free expansion you can model very, very easily, yeah? because it's expansion under uh, just a free... Hamiltonian, and uh, what you uh, then can show is the measure density of atoms after expansion translates to a uh, expectation value of a particular operator involving your bosons at the time when you switched off the trap. Yeah, so this is a particular example of a time-of-flight experiment. Yeah, so what you measure, you measure at time t1, but you can translate what you measure at time t1 to the state of the system at time t0. And at time t0, this uh, measure density of atoms translates into the expectation value of this quantity here. Yeah, so what is that quantity? Some known function. And these are creation annihilation operators of bosons yeah, in these two condensates, of these two uh, leap linear models. So this would be uh, the, the density in uh, the first tube at time t naught. This would be the density in the second two tube at time t naught. And this would be some cross terms, which depend on the separation uh, between the tubes and uh, the time of flight, and so on. And uh, so, so the measured quantity, this density of atoms, which is uh, just measured by putting a screen there and basically counting the number of atoms that reach the screen, translates into the expectation value of this particular operator, which you have to calculate in your system of two split condensates. Yeah? So now if we go back, that's precisely... The, or the type of protocol we have described here for a quantum quench. Because you have a Hamiltonian, yeah, which is basically this uh, two split condensates described by two leap linear Hamiltonians. You have an initial state, which is the state of the system after splitting. Yeah? And what you want to calculate is the expectation value yeah, after the quench at a particular time of a particular local operator. And if you can do that uh, for this particular experiment, then uh, you are happy. Right? I mean, so, uh, and, um, okay, so let's leave it there. So now a few more comments. So the, the cold atomic uh, gases uh, in optical traps are to a good approximation isolated. So what I, mean by that, what I mean by that is there's basically very little coupling to the environment. That's very important for me, because in a quantum quench, I always consider unitary time evolution. There's no environment. There's no dissipation. So this is not exactly true for the cold atoms. So the, the, lead, the, the most important mechanism that violates uh, this um, unitarity is heating. Uh, basically, uh, th these, these atoms are coupled to electromagnetic field, and once in a while, um, uh, a lot of energy gets transferred uh, to, to one atom, and it's large enough for it to jump out of the trap. So you basically lose atoms, and you can count the number of atoms you lose, and over the experimentally relevant time scale, that's a small fraction, but it's non-zero. Yeah? So it's not exactly isolated, but it's uh, to a good approximation isolated. And uh, secondly, there are no other degrees of freedom involved in the story. So you could ask, well, why are you so interested in cold atoms? We know lots of other many particle systems where we could play this game. Like what about solids? Electronic degrees of freedom in solids. Solids. These are fantastic many body systems. Why don't I ask the same questions for electronic degrees of freedom in solids? Well, I can't because in solids, there are lots of other degrees of freedom around. There are impurities, there are phonons, yeah? And uh, what we can do experimentally is we can always look, let's say, only at, at the electrons, 
but we, we cannot simultaneously probe the phonons and, and all the other degrees of freedom that are around. Okay, so, so therefore, um, we, we, the, the, the non-equilibrium dynamics in solids works out very, very differently. Yeah, so if you look at electronic degrees of freedom in solids, you have to think of this as an open system. It's electrons coupled to an environment. The environment are the phonons, and the coupling is actually not small. Okay. Um, and the second comment I want to make is these uh, global quantum quenches I discuss here. They deposit an extensive amount of energy in the system. So that means... So it's an isolated system, so therefore energy is conserved at all times by construction. Okay, so now uh, what is the energy in the, in the system or what is the energy density? The energy density in, in the system is simply given by the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the initial state, divided by uh, system size. That's the energy density in the system, it's conserved at all times, and it is larger, the energy density is much larger than the energy density of the ground state. So that basically means I look at the system in a sector of the Hilbert space which is very, very far away from the ground state. So all the physics I will describe has nothing to do at all whatsoever with the ground state or low-lying excitations. Okay, so, so that's all I wanted to say, I believe. Yeah, so uh, about uh, background, so now you have some questions, please. Yeah, so because you initialize uh, the, the system in some state. So for example, in the experimental example I gave, you split this, this, uh, this tube into two. And when doing that, uh, it costs energy, so to speak. So this is when you put the energy into the system, by preparing the initial state. Yeah? Splitting, dump in energy, and then you, you let it go. Yeah? Are there other questions? Okay. Oops. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so from now on, I, for, uh, for the sake of simplicity, I will focus on lattice, model, lattice models with finite local Hilbert spaces. So they could be, for example, lattice spin models, spin chains. I will focus on Hamiltonians which are invariant under translations, or at least invariant under translations by two sides, three sides, four sides. And I will also focus on initial states which are invariant under translations by M sites. So this is basically to make the discussion simpler. Yeah, so you can, a, a lot of the things I will tell you uh, are valid more generally, but uh, it's, it, it's more difficult to see that, that they're still valid, which is why I constrain myself to this situation. Okay, now I'll use some terminology in the following. So let me introduce it uh, here. I already have told you what's a local operator, but let me repeat it. An operator is local if it acts as the identity outside a finite subsystem in the thermodynamic limit. So let's come back to our lattice spin chains where we have um, L spins along uh, a one-dimensional chain. So what, what kind of operators are local for such a system? Well, a uh, spin operator at a given site is local. Products of spin operators at a fixed distance are local in the thermodynamic limit. But uh, if I now want to consider a very, very large ring of L sites, yeah, so then an operator where the two spins have separation L over 2 is not local. Yeah? And uh, other operators which are not local, if you go to Fourier space, yeah, so if you look at, uh, let's say, the Fourier transform of uh, these spin operators, these are not local either. Now, another terminology I will use is that of a local conservation law. Uh, so that is an operator that commutes with a Hamiltonian, so it's conserved. 
And it can be written as the sum over densities, and these densities are all local operators. That's what I will call a local conservation law. These are very different. I think Joel uh, gave you some lectures about uh, MBL last week before I came. So there you have uh, also local conservation laws, but they're very different to these because there the, the conserv conservation laws themselves are local in space. Here it's the densities which are local operators. It's very different. Okay. So now, uh, what happens after a quantum quench? So I've told you what a quantum quench is. You shake your system initially. It starts out in some quantum mechanical state, and then it evolves. What does it evolve to? So, so, so what happens uh, as a function of time? So the first question we would like to ask is whether the system can somehow relax at late times after the quantum quench. What we, by, what we mean by that is if we wait long enough, do measurements become time independent? Or in other words, if I look at the expectation value in my time dependent state of some operator, if I take the thermodynamic limit first and then take the uh, infinite time limit, does this limit, uh, this infinite time limit exist? It basically would mean um, if it exists, I shake the system, yeah? uh, now I measure my operator as a function of time. Yeah? So what I mean by that in the cold atom experiment, I should have said, after you make a measurement, you have to throw your experiment away, so to speak. So then you have to restart it, right? Because after you have done a measurement, your wave function has, has collapsed. So the way the cold atom experiments are done, they initialize the system in, in, in this initial state. They let it evolve for some time. They measure. Yeah, so they get, they get the measurement outcome, and then that's it. Then they go back and repeat the experiment. They initialize it again. And of these uh, experimental figures you see, beautiful uh, fake color plots, I mean, so, so this is really the uh, outcome of thousands of measurements. Uh, which are plotted in the in the same plot. Okay, and and here we um, okay. Now, wh why is this a meaningful uh, question to ask? It's a meaningful question to ask simply because uh, the systems we consider they can be quite large, they can be macroscopic. Yeah? Ten to the twenty-three atoms, whatever. So I mean, not in the quad atom experiment, but it could be very very large systems, and. Uh, so, so what, what we understand uh, is that uh, quantum statistical mechanics works, right? I mean, so, so the world around us is by and large in an equilibrium state. And what you would expect if a system is large enough, even if you shake it initially, at very, very late times, it somehow should come back uh, to a state which is described by quantum statistical mechanics. That's an equilibrium state. There's no time dependence. Yeah? So, so this is basically where this question comes from. Why you might expect that in some sense the system should relax. Now, the system, obviously the way I've set it up, can never relax as a whole. It's very easy to see. The proof is here. So take your initial state and expand it in a basis of energy eigenstates. Yeah, so this is my uh, state of the system at time t. N are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which induces the time evolution. Okay, so I just basically insert a complete set of states here, so I get this uh, expression, this expansion of the state of the system at time t in terms of the energy eigenstates. I can always do this. Now I can always choose observables that never relax. So let me look at this particular observable. Observable in quantum mechanics a priori is just any Hermitian operator. Could be an observable. Yeah? So this is, uh, it involves uh, two energy eigenstates, which I call 1 and 2. Yeah? And it clearly is Hermitian. Okay, now let me look at the time evolution of this operator 
with respect to this state. So let me look at this expectation value. Now it's a very simple calculation. All of you have done this in your first quantum mechanics course uh, to see uh, only two states are picked out here, one and two, and the result is uh, what I've written here. It's a cosine of the energy difference uh, times the time plus some phase. Yeah? And what it tells you, obviously, is that this expectation value uh, keeps on oscillating uh, indefinitely. And that's precisely what typically happens in single particle quantum mechanics or in few particle systems. Yeah, so they never relax, so they always exhibit persistent oscillations. Okay, so clearly the system can never relax as a whole. Here's the proof. However, now let's look at this operator. This operator you would never be able to measure in, in, in practice because uh, 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 operators that evolve uh, projectors on energy eigenstates are horribly non-local in space. Very, very difficult to think of an experiment that could ever measure anything like this. Yeah? So, the system doesn't relax, uh, but quantum mechanics is a theory of measurement, let's not forget. So, uh, even if this uh, expectation value keeps on oscillating, if I can't measure it, I probably shouldn't care. So now, uh, restricting the observables to a physically meaningful set uh, gets me to where I want to go. So now let's consider local observables. Local observables are simply described by uh, local operators. So here's my entire system, and uh, let me now, uh, just I, I, I partition it into a subsystem which I call B, which I keep finite, and the complement. And then let me uh, imagine I take A, so the complement, to be very, very large, basically infinite. Yeah? And I ask questions only about B. So that means all measurements I do happen only in subsystem B. So that basically means I only measure local operators that involve the degrees of freedom in some subsystem. And that's experimentally a very meaningful set of observables to consider. And then it turns out um, this limit I was interested in does exist for such operators. So let me stress again what, what this limit is. Um, I take local operators so for any local operator OB, this limit exists. I, I take the expectation value in the time evolving state in the thermodynamic limit, so the system literally is infinitely large. And after I've done that, now I can take the infinite time limit and this limit exists. That basically means the expectation value of this operator, if I wait long enough, becomes time independent. No, what, what I mean is the size of A going to infinity. A local operator can be, can be the whole B. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so in particular, this is not very restrictive, I, I should say. Uh, so you also might, might worry, well, it's an expectation value, so it's the average over many uh, measurements. But if you think about it, uh, if you're interested in the probability distribution of any observable, that's actually also uh, the, the characteristic function of that probability distribution is the exponential of a uh, local operator in, in B. So, so the entire probability distribution of observables is actually covered uh, by this. So they will relax as well. I mean, so this is quite a strong statement. Yeah, and basically covers most uh, experimentally relevant uh, settings. No, yeah, absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. So these two limits do not commute. Yeah. So I must first take the infinite volume limit, yeah, and then the infinite time limit. And I'll say quite a lot more about that later. What happens if L is finite, for example? Doesn't exist. Exactly. It's easy to see. Make L small. Yeah. So then you will have recurrences. Yeah. So the system, the, 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 the wave function always have to come back to where it was after some time if the system is small enough, which is not uh, the, the age of the universe. Yeah. So, so the order of the limits is absolutely crucial. Okay, now there's a very nice physical picture that goes with this. 
And uh, so, so yesterday uh, you referred to this as subsystem uh, relaxation, and that's indeed what it is. The physical picture is that A, so the complement of my subsystem, acts like a bath to my subsystem. Yeah? So basically, information can, can leave B, uh, go into A, and never come back. So bath in that sense. Okay, so systems relax at late times after quantum quenches. Now, the next question then obviously is, is there a description of these expectation values at late times in terms of some statistical ensemble? As I have already said, uh, what we expect, kind of like colloquially, if I have some quantum mechanical system, if it's large, I shake it, I wake long enough, it will equilibrate, and at late times it will be described by quantum statistical mechanics or by some kind of deep distribution. Yeah? And that's the question I want to ask. These steady states reached at very late, late times after quantum quenches, can I describe them by some statistical ensemble? And in uh, mathematical terms, uh, the question then is, can we find a density matrix such that for all local operators, the infinite time limit after the quantum quench of the expectation value of the local operator in the time evolving state is equal to the infinite volume limit of the expectation value uh, of the observable uh, in my statistical ensemble. No, 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 no. Well, a, so, uh, a priori, uh, what I will do is I will, that's a very important uh, point, I will construct a density matrix for the steady state in the entire system. What matters, and this is why it's a crucial point, what matters on the right-hand side, and this is what you were referring to, uh, in order to uh, calculate uh, this trace, I only need the reduced density matrix of the subsystem. Yeah? But what I will do to construct the reduced density matrix of the subsystem is, in general, impossible, if you think about it. Yeah? So even for, for a Gibbs distribution, uh, you can't do that. If you have a, a small subsystem, the reduced density matrix will be horribly complicated. So what I will do is I will construct the, the density matrix of the entire system, and what I need here on the right-hand side is just the reduced density matrix. Yeah? And, and basically, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah? So uh, I will construct, you will become a little bit clearer in the following few transparencies, I will construct a density matrix, a density operator, of the entire system. Okay? Which is such that if I take the trace of that density matrix, and it's a trace over the degrees of freedom in the entire system, of that density matrix times my lo any local operator, anywhere, as long as it's local, equals this uh, infinite time limit of the expectation value after the quench. Yeah. It, it's I I uh, so so. That's an important point. So so the statement, in a sense, I will. Um, the statement I will uh, prove is the following. I mean, so, so what this amounts to, it's, it's, a, it's a reformulation of the following statement, which you might like more. So, I have my time evolving state. This is the density matrix of my entire system after the quantum quench. Yeah? Now, I can look at the reduced density matrix of, a, of any subsystem, any finite subsystem B. Yeah? So this is defined as trace over A yeah, of rho of t. Yeah? And uh, what this statement basically uh, amounts to is to say that limit t goes to infinity after the limit L goes to infinity rho B of t 
equals limit L goes to infinity. And here I have trace A row steady state. Yeah, and this would be row steady state B. So the reduced density matrix of any finite subsystem after the quench converges, so that's a complicated operator, but so it converges in some operator norm to the reduced density matrix of some statistical ensemble that I will now construct. Is that? And, and it's completely equivalent to what I've, what I've done here, but uh, this I thought would be a little bit easier because it uh, just uh, sticks to expectation values of operators. Yeah. Now, uh, an important point, we'll come back to that uh, quite a few times, is this description of the steady state by some statistical ensemble is not unique. But this is not surprising because in uh, quantum statistical mechanics, you know, there is a microcanonical ensemble, there is a canonical ensemble, there is a grand canonical ensemble, and they're all equivalent. Yeah. And uh, something very analogous will happen here. Are there any further questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, I can't hear you. Take the take the. So we are we are using algorithmic theorem, right? Because we are going from limit t, t going to infinity to a statistical ensemble. We're using algorithmic theorem. And well, I'm doing quantum mechanics. There is no there is no algorithmic theorem. Okay. Yeah. And you will see, uh, so, so questions about ergodicity will come back in the next few slides. Yeah. So there, there is some notion of ergodicity, yeah, but there's no ergodic theorem. You will see what that means. Okay, so just, just wait uh, a few minutes, and if, if it hasn't become clear, just ask again. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Well, what, what I had said here is the initial states are basically uh, homogeneous, and I do this for simplicity. Yeah. So I, I do only consider global quenches, uh, local quenches, where you put only uh, a small amount of energy into the system. I'm not interested in here because that's just a reformulation of equilibrium dynamics. Yeah. So time-dependent. Uh, Correlation, linear response theory, that, uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about global quenches, where you put extensive amount of energy into the system. Um, inhomogeneous quenches, uh, a, a lot of the phenomenology uh, of uh, what I'm describing carries over uh, to inhomogeneous quenches, but I wanted to stick to homogeneous ones uh, to, for, 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 for reasons of simplicity. Yeah, because... Yes, yes, and, uh, but once again, the best way to understand this is by first understanding the homogeneous case. And so for now, I would like to stick, uh, stick with the homogeneous case. Yeah, so the, the inhomogeneous quenches where the initial state doesn't have any translation invariance, it's also very interesting, and, and there are some new phenomena that occur there, but I, I will not cover this, presumably, unless people are really in. But uh, Joel Moore talked about that already last week to, to some extent, I understand. Um, are there further questions? No? Okay, so now what are these uh, non-equilibrium steady states in, in particular? So now we come back to this notion of ergodicity. Now, what I would like to stress, and I will stress this many, many times, local conservation laws, so those with local densities, are extremely important in this business. And now let me explain why. Okay, so here I have some local conservation laws, so some operator which commutes with a Hamiltonian. Okay, the Hamiltonian induces the time evolution, so that basically immediately tells me that the expectation value of this conservation law is time independent. 
by construction. Okay, because psi of t was e to the minus i h t, yeah, and i n commutes with h, yeah, so you can pull the time evolution operator through, and uh, so this uh, will be the same as the expectation value at time t equal to zero. And this, uh, okay. So now I want to use translational invariance, or at least translation invariance by two sides, three sides, four sides. I discussed the fully translational invariant case, but the generalization to partially broken translation invariance is, is uh, an exercise. So let me look now at the density. So this is some extensive object, this conservation law. Yeah? So it's like uh, energy is extensive, so these uh, conservation laws are also supposed to be extensive, so st uh, scale with system size. So now I want to divide this by the system size, which I call L, yeah? and then consider the thermodynamic limit. Okay, Using translational invariance of my state, I immediately can conclude that these expectation values here are actually independent of this index M. Yeah? And remember that I simply was the sum over M I and M, so these are the densities. Yeah? And so this sum just gives me a factor of L, which cancels this one over L. Okay? So the density, conserved density of the conservation law, is just given by the expectation value of the density of the conservation law. Yeah? Now, importantly, I've said it's a local conservation law, so this is a local operator. So this phenomenology of local relaxation that I have just introduced applies. So because uh, we're dealing with a conservation law, this quantity is time independent, because this quantity is. Yeah? So let's see what this gives us. So this is equal to this. Yeah? And... Um, yeah, which I have rewritten here. So I, 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 so I know that this doesn't depend on time. So the value at time t equal to zero must be equal to the value at time t equals infinity. So this is at t equal to zero, this is at t equal infinity. But at t equal infinity, I have relaxed locally. So any local, the expectation value of any local operator has become time independent. Yeah? And the expectation value is described by my steady state density matrix, by my statistical ensemble, which is what I have here. Okay, so, so was that clear, this derivation? So what I use is I have a conservation law with a local density, yeah? And that implies then that the expectation value of the density of the conservation law in the steady state is the same as the expectation value of the local density in the initial state. That's what I have just shown. Now, what does that mean? It means that the system remembers locally, even at infinite times, properties of the initial state. Okay, so local measurements will know about the initial value of the conservation law. Okay, so the system remains memory, and, and uh, this memory affects local measurements. Okay, so now this is obviously closely related to ergodicity. Yeah? Because the system remembers uh, properties at all times. That means if it was a classical system, so it, yeah, it, it wouldn't explore phase space everywhere. So these conservation laws are absolutely crucial. But now, let's... Um, ah, so here is an aside. So as I said, generalization to where you have partially broken translation invariance is left as an exercise. So you can do this as an exercise, and we can discuss it in the discussion class or whatever that is this afternoon. Um, now, 
uh, the locality of the density of the conserved quantities was absolutely crucial for this argument to work. Yeah? So I used this intimately. Yeah? I used that the density of the conservation law was a local operator, and for local operators I could use this property of local relaxation. So now, as probably all of you know, any quantum mechanical system has as many conservation laws as there are states in the Hilbert space. Yeah, so let me take any Hamiltonian, not integrable, uh, and write the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So here it is. Yeah, so there are conservation laws now, which are called Jn, job psi n, psi n. Yeah. And you see immediately, just by inspection, that these commute with one another and commute with the Hamiltonian. Any Hamiltonian has these conservation laws. Yeah? And well, now they are not extensive, that's one problem, but having them, you could build some extensive ones by taking linear combinations, obviously. However, these conservation laws are not local. They're not local in space at all. They're a mess. And therefore, the discussion I've given you doesn't apply. Yeah? And the only systems uh, that have, well, at least lots of local conservation laws are precisely integrable systems. So it's very difficult to have local conservation laws. Non-local ones, not interesting. But interesting. Okay, so now um, let's come back to the question we had asked. So what happens at late times after quantum quenches? Let's consider the simplest case where the only conserved quantity is energy. Energy is always conserved because the system is isolated. There is no environment. Now let me assume there are no other conservation laws. So Okay, so for the field theorists amongst you, uh, please note I'm now talking about uh, lattice models, uh, so momentum uh, is not extensive for, for, for lattice models. So, so if, if I deal with the field theory, I would basically work with uh, two energy and momentum, but uh, because I deal with the lattice model, I only have energy. Yeah. Um, okay, so now uh, energy is always conserved. That basically means the energy density in the system, which is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the initial state divided by system size, is time independent. Now, this is the minimal information on the initial state that gets retained at all times. Because the system is isolated, yeah? so Hamiltonian is local by construction, uh, by definition of uh, my, my quench protocol. Um, um, <clears throat> so the system always remembers how much energy you put into it through your quench protocol. The minimum amount of information that it retains at all times. Now, if there are no other conserved quantities, apart from energy, then we say the system thermalizes. Now, what does that mean? It means the following. So define a Gibbs ensemble, so I can write it as a mixed state, so this density matrix here, so a normalization, one over the partition function, times e to the minus some parameter times the Hamiltonian. So that's the density matrix of a Gibbs ensemble, so a equilibrium ensemble of, of quantum statistical mechanics. This parameter here, I call it beta f. It's a free parameter at this stage. Then what I do is I fix this free parameter in the following way. So I know, I know what my energy in the system is. It's fixed through the initial state. So if this ensemble, this Gibbs ensemble, is to describe the steady state, it has to reproduce the correct expectation value of energy. So it has to reproduce this. Now, the... Uh, Energy density in, in the system is, uh, there's a 1 over L missing here, sorry, uh, is simply given by 1 over the system size uh, uh, times the trace of your density matrix times the Hamiltonian. So that's one equation. Yeah? And solving it 
fixes this effective temperature. Okay? And uh, now there's no freedom left, so you have a density matrix. It's a Gibbs ensemble of some effective temperature. And uh, I fix the effective temperature by reproducing the correct energy density. That's the only information the system has retained at infinite times. And uh, what happens if energy is the only conservation law? Then uh, local operators, expectation value of local operators, relax in the infinite time volume uh, limit to um, a Gibbs ensemble to a thermal ensemble, yeah, so to a thermal equilibrium state. So and that's precisely what we uh, mentioned before, which is naively what you would expect. You have a very large quantum mechanical system. You shake it a little bit. Initially, you wait long enough. So then at late times, you expect it to be described by some Gibbs ensemble, and it is true in this sense. It's, it's true in the sense of local measurements. Yeah? So you shake it, you wait. If you wait long enough, then you're allowed to make any local measurement you want, local in the sense I've explained, expectation value of some local um, operator. And the outcome of that measurement is indistinguishable yeah, from the expectation value in a Gibbs ensemble at the appropriate temperature. That's nice. Just a second, it's nice, because in a sense, so this explains how quantum statistical mechanics arises from quantum mechanics. Yes, there's a 1 over L missing here, as I said. There's a, there's a 1 over L missing here, so I look at the energy density. Yes, the global one. So once again, what I, what I do is I construct the uh, density matrix or the statistical ensemble for the entire system. Okay? It's a Gibbs ensemble. Okay? Now, as I mentioned before, but let me repeat it, that Gibbs ensemble does not describe the entire system. Because as I explained, the system can never relax as a whole. Yeah? But local measurements are described by this Gibbs ensemble. That means the reduced density matrix of this, this Gibbs ensemble is equal to the reduced density matrix yeah, of the, the system after the quantum quench. Yeah? So that's local relaxation. And that's very, very crucial. I always have to work with subsystems or local operators. Because uh, if I look at the system as a whole, as I explained before, there are always some operators which never relax. Yeah? No different ones. I mean, so, so basically, uh, beta effective is a function of E0. Oh, no, no, but just a moment. I mean, so E0 is constant, right? Because what you do is you uh, pump some energy into the system through your quench protocol. That fixes E0. Yeah, it, now it's, it's God-given, if you wish. It doesn't change in time. That's what you have done by initializing the system. That's how much energy you have put into the system. That fixes uniquely the effective temperature. That's exactly what you would expect. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was a theorem. I mean, so basically, um, what, what the, the, the status is um, twofold. So there are examples. Um, okay, so, so first of all, uh, this, okay, so, so if you look at uh, some of these works, I mean, there's some semi classical. Uh, calculations which put forward uh, ideas like this, but th th there's no rigorous work. Yeah, to prove this rigorously in a mathematical way is is impossible. Uh, so the best evidence we have, I would say, is from numerics. I mean, you can do numerics on fa fairly large systems, in particular in one dimension, and you can convince yourself that this is what typically happens. 
it, well, first of all, it has to be correct. Uh, it is believed to be correct. Um, it is correct, uh, uh, but we can't prove it. Yeah. No, no. Uh, so, so um, for what comes next, uh, for integrable systems, we can, of course, do more. And, and, and so, in particular, for free systems, there are some theorems. There you can prove things. For generic systems, it's very, very difficult to prove something like this. And, and there, is no, there is no proof. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I take your word for it. Uh, so, uh, in a mathematically rigorous way, probably... No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. Uh, so just a moment. So, so I would say not, yeah, because uh, CFDs don't thermalize. So, so they're, they're integrable. So you have conservation laws, I suppose, or yeah. But just a moment. You have to specify some initial state or not. So here, the initial state is completely arbitrary, and that is the difficulty. That is the difficulty. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For a class of initial states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is much more at the same level of what we can do for integral models. Yeah, so, so where we can prove, although, although not in a rigorous uh, way, that systems relax, etc. Um, okay, so that's thermalization. Were, were there any other? Yeah. I come to that. Uh, no, sorry, local conserved quite Sorry, yes. Just give me 30 seconds. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Ah. More than 30 seconds, I have another slide. Well, sorry, I mean, uh, so I, I, I forgot. Yeah, uh, so the, the inequivalence of ensembles. Uh, so what I just wrote for you was the Gibbs ensemble, so some grand canonical ensemble, if you wish, or, or canonical ensemble. I could equally well use a microcanonical ensemble, and there's something interesting, so I, I want to uh, actually go through this. So um, now, uh, instead of constructing this uh, Gibbs ensemble in the way I've done it, I could have also constructed a microcanonical variant uh, in this way. So basically taking energy eigenstates, or eigenstates of my Hamiltonian, and uh, just summing them over some uh, very small uh, energy shell at the right energy density. Okay, and then you know from your, your statistical mechanics course that microcanonical ensemble equals uh, grand canonical ensemble in the thermodynamic limit. Um, so I could have done that. Uh, so now here is something maybe not everybody has heard yet. Uh, so averaging over microcanonical shell is actually not required uh, for local operators. So when we introduce microcanonical ensemble, we usually do the sum and then it becomes a little bit complicated. You actually don't have to do this. Yeah? Once again, this is not proven in, in, a, in a mathematically rigorous way, but there's a lot of evidence. So why is this not necessary? Because uh, the expectation value of local operators in the eigenstates of local Hamiltonians, so that's Hamiltonians whose densities are local operators. Yeah, that's important here again. Uh, so the expectation value um, of... Uh, uh, a local uh, operator in an energy eigenstate in this shell is up to exponentially small corrections in system size equal to the expectation value uh, of the same operator in the other energy eigenstates in the shell. So if I'm interested in the thermodynamic limit, I can forget about this. So then uh, the averages with respect to all of these energy eigenstates of local operators are the same. Uh, 
Um, yeah, yeah, but I am uh, by, by construction. So I'm at a finite energy density. Yeah, I'm, I'm at a finite energy density. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, so, so what it means is if I'm interested in uh, calculating uh, the stationary values of local observables, what I can do, if I can do it, uh, I take a single eigenstate of the Hamiltonian at the right energy density, and then I calculate uh, the expectation value of my local operator in that energy eigenstate. And that gives me the right answer. So in other words, I can drop this sum and work just with a single eigenstate in the microcanonical ensemble. Yeah? And this simplifies life uh, quite a lot. And this is actually what we will do later when we come to, to integral models. Now, how do we know this is true? Once again, uh, it's very difficult to prove things, and I'm, I'm not in the business of proving things anyway, neither are you. Um, but, but uh, there, well, more than me, I suppose, but uh, there's lots of numerical evidence uh, by, by a variety of groups uh, that uh, suggests uh, that what I've just told you is true. But once again, there are no proofs. Yeah? And that's another exercise for you to prove it. Yes, I mean, so this is what is called strong ETH, if you wish. Yeah. Uh, so, so which basically means uh, that within the shell, uh, the the difference uh, of expectation values in in uh, eigenstates in the shell is exponentially small in system size. So, so you can forget about it. And then ETH basically tells you if you uh, change E, the energy density, then uh, these expectation values are basically smooth functions of energy. Yeah, and, and a few more things uh, as well, but. Yeah. yeah, but just a moment. I mean, so you're not allowed to start uh, in a single energy eigenstate in, in the quantum quench because I ruled that out from, yeah. Where what matters? Okay, but I'm not starting with the row SS. This is the steady state. This is the end result. So I shake it, I let it go, and then I'm asking, what do the expectation values settle to? Yeah, and this is a description of, of the final ensemble. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so this would be the microcanonical version. And uh, for integral models, which we will come to next, uh, this is actually more convenient than the uh, grand canonical or, or canonical description. So even though you said that you don't need to average over these, uh, but ETH requires you to see the fluctuations uh, between the neighboring eigenstates, right? So your ETH, to verify ETH in some sense, you need to see the fluctuations of this across an energy shell yes. in some sense. Yes. So to see whether a system is thermal or not, you need to probably have these window of states in some sense. Uh, but just a moment. So here, what I have said is I know that I have no conservation laws other than energy. Yeah. Or thermal. So I, I am thermal in a sense, so I turn it around. If I don't know, there could be some conservation laws, I would have to uh, do what you say. Yeah. So, so one way you could just use this as a, as a diagnostic, as you suggest. Yeah. Um, all right. Here we go. So now. It was a little bit longer than 30 seconds, but uh, so now let's come to the case where we have other conservation laws. Yeah? Um, so I will only consider conservation laws with local densities for the reasons I... Because non-local ones are just not very interesting. They don't 
do anything. Yeah. Um, now, as I have uh, shown you before, if I have additional conservation of the local densities, uh, then the system retains information about the initial states at all times. Yeah, so I've shown this to you before, this equation here. Yeah, so the expectation value of the density of the local conservation law in the initial state is equal to the expectation value of the, the density of the local conservation law in the steady state. So that means in the steady state, the system remembers things other than energy about the initial state. It remembers all expectation values of uh, the uh, local conservation laws. So that immediately tells you the system cannot possibly thermalize, because thermalization means the only information that is retained about the initial state is energy. So we cannot thermalize. So what happens instead? Well, um, so if I have a bunch of uh, uh, conservation laws, 17, let's say, so I have 17 such equations, and then uh, you can go back to a very famous paper by Jaynes in 1957, so he basically tells you what you should do in such a case. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to maximize uh, the free energy or the entropy under these constraints. Yeah? And uh, that amounts to consider what's called a generalized uh, Gibbs ensemble. And this form goes back to Jaynes in 1957. So what you, what you have to do is, instead of just considering Newtonian, uh, so the energy, you basically have to consider all the conservation laws with some Lagrange multiplier. Yeah? And uh, fixing the Lagrange multiplier is basically a map to implementing these constraints. Yeah? And uh, so that's given here. So these lambda, sorry. So these lambda m's are not free. Yeah, there's no, not a single free parameter in the business ever. So they are fixed by these conditions. And these conditions are basically uh, just these, namely the expectation value of the conservation law in the initial state has to be reproduced by the expectation value in the steady state ensemble, so that's a necessary condition. Yeah. And solving these necessary conditions fixes these lambda m's, and then uh, the, 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 the steady state under this construction simply would be the maximum entropy state under these conditions. The most likely state which reproduces all the information the system must have uh, in, in, in the steady state uh, because of the presence of conserved quantities. Can you, yeah. Yeah, so like supposing your subsystem is finite, but you take the L infinite limit. So I guess you still need an infinite number of uh, conserved quantities and uh, corresponding Lagrange multipliers. Is that right? Uh, no. So here, this construction, as I have introduced it, uh, I can have a finite number of conservation laws. So 17 is absolutely fine, or three, or two. So, so the grand canonical ensemble is, a, is an example of this. Uh, but supposing you like your system is really integrable and you have like uh, infinite number yes. of concepts. Ah, okay. So, so in the integrable case, indeed, I would have uh, in the in the finite volume, let's say, in a large finite volume, in order to make everything well defined, I always have to first consider the system in a large finite volume, do my calculation, and then take the limit uh, L goes to infinity. Yeah, because otherwise nothing is well defined. Well. <laughs> To do calculations is much harder, let me put it like this. So, so this is the way we do the calculations. And uh, in the, in the finite, large finite volume, I basically will have L local conservation laws in the integrable case. So, so a number that is extensive, so that scales with system size. That is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll 
consider a, a particular case uh, next. So if, if, even though the subsystem is really finite, right? It could have just... See, that's a very good question. Yes, I mean, um, yes, I mean, so the, it, exactly. So, um, even though I can consider a subsystem which a priori could just be two sites or one site or three sites, yeah? So then what you're asking is, is it really the case that I need infinitely many uh, conservation, I mean, they need infinitely many Lagrange multipliers, so to speak, to describe all the measurements uh, in this really, really tiny subsystem. Yeah, so that is the question. So the answer is, strictly speaking, yes. However, and I'll mention this a little bit uh, further on, as we showed a few years ago uh, with my then post of Maurizio Fagotti, if you have such a small subsystem, if you now ask a slightly a uh, weaker question, um, if I want to reproduce the outcome of any measurement within an accu accuracy epsilon, I don't want to uh, reproduce it with infinite accuracy, but just within some error, how many conservation laws do I need? And then the answer is, you don't need infinitely many, you need basically a number uh, that is closely related to the size of your subsystem. Okay, but, but in order to make that, uh, you have to put a, a weaker requirement of how precisely you want to describe the steady state. Yeah, so we, I'm happy to, do, to discuss this more um, if, if, if people are interested, but perhaps a little bit later. So, now where are we? So, so this is a generalized Gibbs ensemble. And now, so everything has been extremely abstract, and Sasha already complained, there are no calculations, there are just claims. So now let me uh, take a very, very simple example, an embarrassingly, embarrassingly simple example. It's the simplest example I could come up with. But it captures quite a lot of uh, what's actually going on. And it also uh, then allows me to give the students amongst you, if there are any, uh, some homework exercises. So here's the explicit example. It's a tight binding model. It's just uh, fermions, spinless fermions, hopping along a one-dimensional ring. All right. Couldn't be any easier than this. So now uh, this model is integrable. It's exactly solvable. And so we can look at what happens in quantum quenches in exquisite detail. So how do you diagonalize the Hamiltonian? Well, you just go uh, to momentum space. Yeah? So you define creation annihilation operators in momentum space uh, just uh, by Fourier transform. And uh, I put periodic boundary conditions, which quantizes my momenta. Yeah? So, so the allowed value of momenta is choose 2 pi n over L, and n are all integers between 1 and L. Okay, so then in terms of these creation annihilation operators, the Hamiltonian uh, now is diagonal. It's some energy, which is just some uh, uh, cosine dispersion, times the number operator of fermions with momentum p. Okay, so here the Hamiltonian just breaks up into a sum of different momentum sectors, and each momentum sector is, is very simple. It's either occupied or unoccupied. Okay, um, so now that's my Hamiltonian, which was ingredient one of uh, quantum quench. Now ingredient two was an initial state. So now let me give you an initial state of the type which called atom experimentalists like. So it's an initial state, which is a product state, so very lowly entangled, unentangled actually, uh, where you have um, fermions on every other side. Yeah, so basically, Initially, so here's my ring. Here are my sites on the ring. And now what I do is I put fermions on every other side. So I do this. And now I probably... Yeah, that's exactly what I figured. Okay, so something like this. That's not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, clearly. Yeah. Um, and you can ask all the questions I just asked. Yeah? So what is the steady state? How do, how do local operators evolve in time, etc.? 
So now, to do time evolution here is very easy, because you can just solve the equation of motion for the Fermi equation annihilation operators uh, in momentum space, you just solve the Heisenberg equation of motion. This is the solution of the Heisenberg equation of motion. Yeah, I'm sure all of you know that. And using that, I can calculate the Green's function. How are we doing? Yeah. So a single, single particle Green's function equal time in momentum space now would be just this expectation value. Okay, so I've just told you uh, what uh, the, the time-evolved creation annihilation operators are. So using that, I have to calculate uh, this expectation value here. Okay, and now all I do is I go back and express these momentum space operator in terms of the real space ones. Yeah, so using this. And this gives me then this double sum. Okay, this expectation value now is very easy to calculate, yeah, because that's just a Fox state, yeah, and so this expectation value is, value is zero unless m is equal to n, um, and n is even. So there's a fermion there. So I've chosen it very simply. So this is your answer. Yeah, so that's the Green's function of momentum space after the quantum quench. Now, observation one, very trivial. Uh, this doesn't relax, it oscillates in time indefinitely. Not a problem, because this is not a local operator, because it involves operators in Fourier space. Yeah? So it basically involves, uh, if I write it in terms of real space here, it involves terms where the two fermion operators, creation and relation operators, are infinitely far away from one another. So it's not a local operator, there's no reason for this to relax. Okay, no worry. However, now if I go back to real space, then things should relax, according to what I've told you. So let's do the... Uh, oops. Let's do, okay, so this is what I just showed you. So here is the Green's function in real space. Yeah. So, um, all I have to do now is I express these real space operators in terms of the momentum space ones by Fourier transform, yeah, and then I uh, put in this result for the momentum space Green's function, and this gives me this expression here. Yeah, so that's an exercise to fill in the... Sorry? No, just a moment. So this is a different Green's function. Yeah? So literally it's the Fourier transform of this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I take the Fourier transform of this. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I get. Yeah, yeah? Okay? And uh, so this is a complicated sum, but then as usual, now if I take uh, infinite volume limit, I can, I can turn uh, sums into integrals, and then I'm sure somebody in the last couple of weeks has shown a formula like this already, so, so you basically get this Bessel function uh, as a function of time for this single particle Green's function in the L goes to infinity limit. Okay, sorry? Yes, and what else do you know about it? It's a highly oscillatory function, and what happens at late times? Well, this is there, but what happens with this when little t goes to infinity? Yeah, so it goes to zero like one over square root of t. And so now you should be happy. Why? So it relaxes, it goes to a constant value. And I told you, you know, so local relaxation happens. And so here's an example. Okay, so this is the answer. And uh, so now at late times and fixed uh, positions, uh, you just use the asymptotic of the, of the Bessel function, which is like one over square root of t times the, the oscillatory behavior. But the important point is this actually vanishes at very late times, 
And indeed, there is a power law relaxation to a stationary value of the single particle Green's function. And I just take maybe two more minutes or so, uh, if that's all right. Is that all right? Sorry? Yeah, the two, two. That's a two. The four is a two. Thank you. Somebody's paying attention. I mean, okay, good. Um, so now this is just a single particle Green's function. So you might say, well, it's one local operator, but you know, so you told us any local operator. But here's the proof, actually mathematically rigorous proof uh, for this particular case that any local operator relaxes because it's a free theory, this tight binding model. And for free theories, you know, uh, well, and for free theories and uh, the, the state I consider, yeah, which is a Fox state, there's a Wick's theorem that basically tells you any multipoint correlation function yeah, of C's and C daggers can be written um, as a sum of a product of single particle Green's functions. And now all of these relax locally and basically means this has to relax locally as well. So 4.6 point, 6 point, 8 point, whatever. Yeah? So basically any local operator will relax locally in a power law fashion. Yeah, so this is the last slide and then I stop, sorry. Now, what is the ensemble describing the, the stationary state? Uh, okay, so I know the single particle Green's function in the infinite time limit relaxes uh, to, to this very uh, simple answer, and this has to be recovered by my steady state uh, density matrix. And you can easily convince yourself uh, a infinite temperature state, so uh, using uh, as the steady state density matrix just this flat average gives you the right answer. Okay, and basically what you have done by choosing this particular initial state, this product state, where Fermi, where Fermi is on every other side, you have, you have uh, pumped an infinite amount of energy into the system. That's why you end up with an infinite temperature state. And you can easily check, uh, so calculating this, it's 1 over 2 to the L trace, C dagger J, uh, C K, so now just do it in a Fox state basis in, in position space, you see it, it uh, reproduces the correct answer. And so by Wick's theorem, then this gets lifted to all local operators because uh, you have a Wick's theorem with respect to the infinite temperature state. And I've run out of time, so thank you for your attention. Yeah, so this is uh, about the entanglement of the state. Um, yes. um, I, I think because of the Fermi statistics, uh, you have to take a Slater determinant of uh, this. So I presume, I'll presume that it will be like a sum of uh, many terms with the appropriate uh, permutations. So it will have an entanglement, although in terms of the, you know, Fox space representation that you have, but if you, that you have written, it looks like all products, but if you take a wave function of this in terms of in a many particle, uh, if you write down the many particle wave function, it's, it seems to me that it should have terms which are sums because of the anti-symmetrization and it will have an entanglement because of that. Well, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's a product state in, in uh, position space. Uh, we see. And, and because it's a product state, uh, it, it, it will not have entanglement. Mm. Yeah, okay. Maybe... Um, so it depends mm -hmm. entanglement in what space uh, you consider. So, but if I consider spatial entanglement, um, I don't mm. think it should have. I see. Yeah. But uh, if, if you look uh, entanglement in particle space, there will be some entanglement. I mean, this is true. Mm. Any other questions? This uh, process of uh, reading out the list of effective temperatures, like uh, list of Lagrange multipliers, the, the process of getting the effective temperature, that's, that's, that, that's fairly trivial procedure once you know the... Oh, is, is, that's my question, so is it... Oh, it's a question. Uh, so, yeah. no, it is one over a fairly trivial uh, procedure. Uh, so, in this case, you basically sort of 
just by looking at it, you can guess that it's infinite temperature. I'll, I'll, what I will do uh, tomorrow, whenever my next next lecture is, I mean, I'll go in a little bit, I'll go in a little bit more detail. So let's go back to the the generalized Gibbs ensemble. Um, so for free theories like the model I've just discussed, you can solve this very easily, and I'll I, I think I'll I'll show you that explicitly. Now, um, when you do interacting integral models. Um, these equations uh, are highly non-trivial. And there is a procedure you have to follow in order to make sense of this. Yeah? And I will discuss what it is. But in practice, uh, for interacting integral models, uh, we try to avoid, and we do avoid, having to ever calculate these uh, Lagrange multipliers. It turns out, as I have shown you here, I can work with this generalized Gibbs ensemble, or I can work with some microcanonical version. In practice, we prefer working with a microcanonical uh, version, because I, then I don't need these Lagrange multipliers, which are actually only good uh, for fixing the most likely state uh, corresponding to this ensemble, which would be the microcanonical one, and that's the only role the Lagrange multipliers have. So I don't need them for, for anything. I mean, so I basically just need to know what is the state of equilibrium under these constraints. That's what we will do uh, for interacting integral models. But I will show you a little bit why it's so difficult uh, to solve these equations for, for interacting integral models. Right. But for non-integral models to read the effective temperature, that should be, that's just the effective temperature. No, no not, uh, is that uh, well uh, so in the previous slide? Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, so, so basically, what is this, this step, second last step. From there, you need to get beta effective, right? Yeah, so, 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 so basically, you have to calculate this. Yeah, and uh, if the initial state is sufficiently simple, take it a product state or something, then you can do the calculation even for non-integral Hamiltonian. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, so then you yeah. basically it's, it's not so difficult. But if it's interacting, even this is difficult. No, no. I mean, so even in the interacting case, yes, yes, uh, yes. if the initial state is easy, you can calculate the energy density, yes, yes. and, and, and yes. then. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so you have to do some, uh, so in practice what we do to fix the effective temperature, uh, we do uh, quantum Monte Carlo. I see, yes. Okay. Something like this, some, numer some numerical method uh, for non-integral systems. Okay. But they are basically standard uh, numerical methods that allow you to do that. Okay. Yeah. But is it... Non-integral. Yeah. Yeah. But is it a useful thing to calculate the effective temperature? Or? Of course it is. I mean, people write. I mean, it depends on what you mean by useful. If you, if you consider writing uh, nature papers useful, uh, so then I would say the answer is yes. Yeah. So, for example, I mean, uh, I didn't mention this uh, before. We're running a little bit over, but let me just uh, rant a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, now I said effective temperature. Yeah. Uh, but the way I've introduced it, well, it's not a temperature, it's a parameter. Yeah? So in particular, there is no reason why this should be positive. And as a matter of fact, in general, it isn't. It can be negative. And in the cold atom experiments, uh, you can realize situations where the temperature is negative. Yeah? And then you write a nature paper and uh, it's nice. Yeah? I assume I've never done it. But... Um, and so, so the reason basically is, if you think about the spectrum of your Hamiltonian, this is the spectrum of your Hamiltonian. It's bounded for me in the large finite volume because I have a lattice model with finite local Hilbert space. Yeah? So now I pump some energy into the system that fixes some energy density for me. Yeah? So let's say this one here. Okay, so now here, this would be zero temperature. Yeah? So then infinite temperature is typically somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Yeah? And then uh, this uh, would be T equals uh, zero minus, I suppose. This is zero plus, And this would be T, uh, T equals minus infinity. So something like this, I suppose. 
Well, I might have uh, flipped these two now. I don't let me. Oh, I have it right. Yeah, and and so you see that in a cold atom experiment, you just can pump enough energy into the system that you prepare some state here, and that corresponds to a negative temperature. And this indeed was done by Emanuel Bosch's group, and uh, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. And uh, I guess he. Uh, I kept on complaining. He, he got uh, into a lot of uh, trouble uh, with uh, statistical mechanics people who think negative temperatures are sinful. Yeah, but uh, so in that sense, you you have to be careful about what you mean by temperature. So for us, it's just a parameter. Uh, my comment was exactly this, and it is exactly what happens in the example that you gave us. There, you have a temperature infinity and. I think you said you were pumping an infinite amount of energy. Actually, the density of energy is finite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's exactly in the yeah, middle. Yeah, yeah. Because here you have fermion, so it's yeah, yeah. like a spin half. And infinite temperature there means in the middle. Yes. And there are negative temperatures for spin half. You just... Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm happy we agree, not everybody agrees. I mean, so, so as long as one uh, interprets temperature in this way, there is no problem. Yeah. So is it useful? Yes, it is useful. Yeah. Any more question or rants? <laughs> okay, so let's thank Fabian again.